Ladies and gents, welcome back to Inside the Songs. And today it is my absolute joy and delight to be joined by the legendary metal drummer, Mike Malian. Mike, how are you, sir? I'm doing really well, thanks, buddy. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm having a lot of fun talking to lots of wonderfully talented people on my new podcast. So it's uh, it's super fun. I'm really happy for you with that. I mean, it's uh, it's a crazy little thing that's been going on that we've been working on for a while. And I'm really happy for you that you're able to put that out together and make some connections and have some cool chats. Yeah, yeah. So let's so let's talk about our EP, right? So our EP, Cult of the Lamb, Hymns of the Unholy, is now out. People can go and stream it. And there's some cool content online already on YouTube that we both put out. Tell me what you thought about that project when I first came to you about it. What were your initial thoughts? Well, I mean, I was absolutely stoked at the idea i'm a big gamer i love video games i love like stories and getting involved in stuff and it always felt like something that i always wanted to do but would never come my way to get to be a part of something not just in video game music but in metal and uh, you know something that's so close to my heart in so many ways so uh, absolutely thrilled kind of was like y- you sure you got the right guy here you know like <laughs> yeah it was um it was a real kind of dream dream country project for me on a number of levels you know being able to do these rearrangements in a s- style that i absolutely adore and also you know the opportunity to work with some really high profile musicians from both sides of the pond was was amazing from your perspective approaching it as a drummer what what were your considerations what were your thought processes in terms of how you how you applied yourself to the project obviously i sent you some demos they had some midi drums on them already how did you interpret those and decide what you wanted to do with them in comparison to what's on the final songs well it's really interesting you should ask that because it was a really unique experience i've done a lot of session playing for lots and lots of different bands over the years but i've never before heard my groove pack drums back and been like huh so this programming's really quite neat this really sounds kind of like something i'd play this is this is really cool and you were like no i didn't program that that's you i was like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> and then i was like and there there's one section in one of the songs i can't remember what it is but it's the most I think when I was doing the pack, I I kind of went like, well, we'll see if this is useful for anyone. And it was kind of a a means test of like, what do I think is too weird, like too open? And I think it's like there's a riff somewhere that's like dun 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 dun. And it's like uh, I was when I made it, I was like, I don't think anyone will use it, but I'll be really interested to see if anyone does. And then you throw a whole riff back at me with that, and I'm like, so then I'm charting what I made then charting it again to like change it up a bit and kind of make it part of that but it was that was completely unique for me i remember exactly where it was because i remember at the time you going oh my god you used that and it's and it's ended up being like the (laughs) biggest hook of the whole record which is in death where it drops into like this big like eight layers of vocals sean's doing a super sick like counter melody on the guitar and like these really spacious open drums. And it's like the biggest, fullest hooky bit in the whole record, um, which was something that when you wrote, you thought it was like throw away, you know, filler in the midi pack type thing, which is hilarious. But for yeah, those people right. that don't know, I when I was kind of first fleshing out rhythm tracks for uh, for this EP, I, I, I'm not ashamed to say I used loads of GGD parts and in particular Mike's um, GGD midi drum pack as a starting point for these arrangements, um, which you know then got adjusted and altered through several different kind of phases of adjusting into you know the grooves and the riffs that are there now. But obviously, from your perspective, hearing something that you'd written but not knowing the context straight away, I was like, "Wait a minute, this is this is like not not normal. What's going on?" Yeah. So like uh, a unique project in so many different ways and extra unique in that it took stuff from and if you're interested in it that's called the super gent midi pack by ggd it's it's really fun there's a whole bunch of songs in there like structured to be able to sort of have potential verses potential choruses potential breakdowns so i'd actually be really interested to hear from your perspective was that layout actually useful as a writer did i haven't seen what it looks like when you have the product inside their engine but I know what I gave them was like a map of like 
three verses or quiet bridges, three choruses or loud bridges, one or two vomit riffs, uh, a vomit riff and a vomit halftime riff. That's like a bit of a Lamb of God reference from like a vomit riff they have in, I think it's called Hourglass or something, but uh, it's like, and then also like breakdowns, halftime breakdowns and things like that. And that was kind of standardized across 15 different songs. Did it look like that when you used it? I think from what i remember it's just laid out as song one through 15 and then groove one to however many per song i don't recall well, that's a if shame. It's, i don't recall if it's labeled as like verse chorus whatever maybe it is maybe i'm not remembering but i, I think when i'm when i'm using those things i don't necessarily think about you know is this meant to be a verse part is this meant to be a, a group i kind of just flick through and listen like and where's where's the style of thing that i'm looking for what can i grab and adapt you know, mm. it, am I looking for something that's already got like a double kick groove in it? Or am I looking for something that's crash riding with a halftime thing that I can then adapt to whatever chuggy thing I've got going on? So I'm normally when I'm picking a pattern as a starting point, I'm just listening for the kind of thing that is based around the tempo that I'm working at and that I can then adapt rather than was the artist intention meant to be a, you know, a verse or a chuggy or a vomit or whatever. Um, sure. Yeah, but... I think there's like, Definitely, they were always meant to be guidelines anyway, but it's it's really interesting because when you're diving through presets, you're diving through packs and stuff, looking for inspiration, I feel like there's this journey I go through whenever I do that of like, I have the sound in my head and the more I click, the further away from it I get that even if I found something that was close to what I had in mind, by the time I get to it, I've, I've lost track completely of what the imagined sound was and I kind of have to start again. And I feel like you only get so many opportunities to hear something before the idea might be lost forever because you're looking there because it's not easy to just flesh it out immediately getting that sound from the head so you yeah. know it's but that might just be me i mean that might just be the adhd it, brain you know being a nightmare <laughs> it, it reminds me of a conversation i had with a client not so long ago though i was um i was doing some synth, synth programming on a record that i was producing for a client and they wanted to you know to particularly focus on kind of analog synth sounds. Uh, so I was using IK Multimedia's Syntronic 2 and working through all those analog libraries. And he's like, you know, how do you choose what patch you want to work from as a starting point when you have thousands and thousands and thousands? I'm like, it's pretty simple. I use the filters on the library to specify the, sa the sort of sound that I'm looking for. And then when I find something that I like, I don't second guess myself. I go, I like that. I'm going to work with it because when you have so many options, it's, it's like the classic, you know, producer, like snare bombing thing, going through 500 different <laughs> snares but to end up back where you started. Like you, you can spend days of your life listening through snare samples in your library and, you know, and not make a decision. So if you hear something that you like, just go with it, put it in your project and, and start working. That's, that's my approach anyway, because you, you can just spend forever just, you know, trawling through all of your libraries yeah well it's a workflow um, thing as much as anything isn't it if it's a really easy workflow if you follow the path that's given to you by programs and by people who've made user experiences you'll always get the same output it's when you it's when you interrupt the easy way and you go approach it from a hurdle perspective the creativity comes out let's swing back to the ep for a moment what do you think of it as a guy that's played on Lots of records for lots of artists, everyone from obviously Monuments to Tesseract and Periphery and all sorts of other things. Where does this record sit in your experiences and what memories do you take with you for, for the rest of your life? <laughs> <laughs> These treasured childhood memories, core memories unlocked, they'll never lose. <laughs> I mean, so it's, two, it's a double barrel question. So, I mean, in comparison to, compared to other sessions that I've done, again, super unique because it was like I'd already done the demoing process in my drums before I'd heard the stuff. But yeah, getting to hear boss music, because as I understand it, it's four boss battles and the one main theme. Isn't that the record kind of, or is it five, five boss battles? Five and, five, five and one, yeah. So the first, I, I the get first confused track. about is it a six track or is it a seven track with a radio edit? That's where I keep getting confused. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. being that it's like a, five different boss battles and one main theme the cool part was i've always loved the idea of what it would be like to transliterate the gaming experience onto onto the the metal thing but the fact that you'd come and already done those arrangements meant that it was like coming into a record where the pre-production had already happened 
someone with the mind to construct has constructed. And usually coming into a session, I respect the original drummer's vibe and I add my vibe to that. But in this instance, there was a bit of Sam drumming, programming world, but there was a lot more me already in there. So it felt very much like something almost like I'd composed because it was, you know, the closest it could be for like parts that I composed because kick drums lead the way with the riffs. They kind of define like the framework with which everything is then built. But um, the fact that that is merged with these original compositions in such a cool way, I didn't even check out the original compositions until afterwards. I had no need to, but afterwards I've kind of played the boss battle music over the boss battle videos of it. Um, and I'm intending to, when I get it, I'm intending to have the record ready to go and then I'm going to mute the game music and play it for myself and maybe record it because I just I want to know how that experience folds forwards into the gameplay feeling because I feel like the tone of that music with this rearrangement if I if I didn't know better I would say that suits the game more for me because of the kind of evil well not evil but satanic cultish slash kawaii kind of cutesy look but the music doesn't sound like that at all it sounds really dark and mysterious and uh, almost like aramaic or you know from a faraway land without sounding cheesily like a frigid dominant faraway land if you know what i mean so mm -hmm. there's a lot of answers to that one question but we're talking about a unique experience here so it's I kind of have to go into the the details but yeah i i feel like it's something that will never happen again in in its way um and it's been really nice to play with what narrative what narrative non-linear music can become when it becomes linear and reimagined and now i really want to spend more time trying to now do that process in a non-linear fashion like how mm -hmm. games work where everything start points and end points and uh, peaks and troughs are directed by the player experience not by the the decisions to show a narrative in audio from minute one to minute seven you know that's the experience i'm going to take with it for the rest of my life is it it's given me it's kind of engaged me into music for tv and game in a way that i now do a lot more of because it's given me some confidence in that field and it's really ticks a box inside my kind of my heart and soul so there's a lot more that i'll do with it and with that kind of stuff as a result of this and um just super grateful for you believing in me and uh and you know asking for me to be a part of it it's you know just been so much fun not at all it was uh it was amazing to, to have you on on the session thank you so much for investing so much energy in it um talking of, of sessions i want to m move away from the game and into you more as a as a professional what is your process when you move from session to session what is your if you like checklist when you go into a new session what are you looking to identify what fresh perspective are you trying to bring you know so you walk into a studio what are you looking for in that studio what relationship are you looking to establish with the recording engineer or with the producer or the artist how do you present yourself and impose yourself without um without taking over because it's it's a difficult balance to to try and strike right Definitely. Uh, well, it, it changes. Every every session is unique in that it really depends. I mean, first off, I have to. There are there are totally different vibes when I'm just doing it at home on my own, and I'm set, and I'm then producer, engineer, liaison, player, uh, e editor, all of that. So you know, I'm handling the minutia of the technical details alongside the playing, and that changes the relationship massively because whenever I have a a producer or a producer and engineer or combo like yourself it's a completely different experience and it's much more about me walking in and go if i were to start imposing immediately i essentially i've just removed the possibility for me being produced at all so the number one thing is don't assume you know everything come in with a learner's mindset every day is a school day the, the day that you stop learning is the day that you stop trying to learn the day that you close yourself off from new op opportunities it's more scary to go into things like that but i find it quite natural because i can read the room quite quickly of what's happening who wants what from this where are the emotional focal points but technically i'm looking for the drum stem on its own and then i'm looking for the rest of the music either as stems or just without drums because i'll then listen to it together i'll get to know the story that the, the drums that were written are trying to tell and that will be like the growth will be from that and that intention upwards into what I think it can grow into. But I'm trying to like, 
I'm always trying to give like um what's the word? I'm trying to pay respect to the drummer on the demo and usually that's a guitarist who's programmed and clicked in dots mm -hmm. and it doesn't sound quite right but I, I I've got a very imaginative kind of mind when it comes to music so I can hear I can hear past a lot of all of these details that are missing and into where it can be and it's rare that I will suggest to change something up but in the process of changing it up I'll also trust the producer within me to maybe suggest stuff even as as big as uh, structure changes chord changes other parts and how they marry to the drums but that in itself is also so conditional on am i playing to finish parts am i playing to finish parts that are to be re-recorded or am i playing to a demo that i have this feeling that once i if i have this feeling that once i do what i do they'll then take it back and then treat that as another level of kind of production and writing uh, it's sort of like you know how close does it feel like it is to the end journey and why does it feel that close chances are it's not by accident so are the band amazing at self-producing is the producer has they have they just got such a clear vision and in your case you had such a clear vision here so you know on this ep so it was very easy for me to be like okay cool well i'll achieve all the things that the accents that you've made are working off of but i might apply some improvisational or otherwise kind of like emotional conducting to the process i feel like that's a huge part of what i as a drummer give is i'm like i'm like the conductor from the back it's how hard i hit the cymbals the tone i hit the cymbals with the intention i give i can swell and decay in a way that distorted guitars can't really do because guitar goes into saturation and then if the guitar turns down to like 10 percent of volume the tone is different but uh, the, the volume is still very much there and then it dies off very quickly because it's like super slammed yeah so and vocalists you know they can have a lot of room to play with but only if they're given space i i reference this book all the time uh, but the music lesson by victor wooten is i think the most important book that any musician can read to understand how to give others space and how to use silence and restriction as uh, focal points rather than loudness Anyone who's ever been around any children will know that if you keep shouting at them, they'll just tune out the shouting and it won't catch their attention. So it's like very much the adult's thought of what will work. If I, if I yell at you, you'll pay attention. But actually, sometimes it's in the spaces, it's in the quietness, it's in the... And that is directional. Silence is so directional in that way. So the record well, already has those dynamics. I didn't have to add them. So my process was so different yeah. there as well. And you know the the the, uh, the famous expression "silence is deafening" is is so very true, isn't it? I mean, if you if you think about the power of of the brain like in in all of your um, familiar circumstantial locations, your brain gets used to the background noise and mm -hmm. tunes stuff out. You know, so whether that's in your bedroom where you where you sleep or in your studio where you where you work, any sound underlying sound that is constantly there, like. For me, when I'm working here in my control room, it might be the AC behind me here. Or if that's off and I've got like total silence, it might be this real background hum of my power conditioners under my under my desk here. You know, my brain tunes those things out because it's like, I know they're there, but I don't want to hear them. But then when those sounds aren't there, it's like, hang on a minute, something's missing. You know, so the brain is like super smart, super, super smart. And, you know, so as you say, playing around with spaces and not feeling the need to necessarily fill everything with sound is like such a crucial skill for a musician, such a crucial skill. Massively. It goes down to like, if I'm the drummer, I'm just playing fun drum parts. But if I'm the musician, I'm listening to what how the drums relate to everything else, not just the other instruments and what they're playing, but especially in a recording environment where it's, I do a thing and then I send it and then something else can happen. I could play along with this really chunky bass performance, but I feel like the bass is way too loud for what I think it could be. So I'll play quiet with the intention that it will then work with it. But, you know, I have to get approval on all ideas. So uh, usually my session process is I'll do demos on MIDI. Uh, I'll check that the parts and the, if they're big changes, you know, I'll check it was that cool. And then I'll take that MIDI, turn it into a chart, and then I'll then track lots of versions of everything. And then within every version... I'll pick my favorites for the song and I'll always try to put the song first. And then at any moment I could just get time codes back that say, 
I want that bit to sound a bit different. I want that bit to be more like the original. I, there may be a debate there where I'm like, uh, there may be something a bit more holistic as a teacher, as a tutor that I can maybe talk to them about. What is it emotionally that they're attached to there? And do they trust me that I've had an opposite experience because I'm kind of coming in? Because the, the role of a session player or a vendor in any sense is that they've got outside perspective. And sometimes that's invaluable. But I'm never stubborn enough to say like, no, it's, it's my way or the highway. Ultimately, it's always I'm the session player. I'm the vendor. I'm not the person who I'm not necessarily the one with the most important emotions to play with yet. So I'll always go yeah. with the final say of the musician. But our vibe was very much you trusted in me to basically do whatever I want. And you comped for me. You picked all your favorite moments. You picked moments that I wouldn't have picked. Every editor, every producer comps differently. And I'm not... I. I changed my playing because of Matt Halpin when I filled in for Periphery. I actually, in this room, after being asked on the same day, the day before the show, uh, can you play this set with us because my shoulder's been knocked out of its socket and I can't play. So then that, that's like 12 p.m. 2 a.m. the next day, so 14 hours later, we're in this room and I can't play the very specific details that they wanted me to do. And he was like, why are you doing it so specifically? Why don't you break it down into like a very basic pattern that you can kind of jam with two hands as opposed to like one on ghosts and one on, uh, you know, one on quiet snares and one on cymbal only. Why not jam it on a steering wheel and then get comfortable with the steering wheel, get comfortable with the instrument and then see what happens in the studio. And I've, I've never gone backwards from that. I've only grown more into that. It's just been, how do I ingest all of those details? And like with your session, charts are the best. I mean, I think our process was very much like I hadn't had the time to chart properly before I'd showed up. So... I'd probably chart a song for an hour or two for two songs and then we'd just go track them and then you'd work on the comps and I'd go back to charting. That was pretty much how we how we ran it, wasn't it? Yeah, that was pretty much it. And I and I seem to recall as well that um, you didn't even know that there were six songs until like you were basically on the plane coming out here to Spain. I think I think I told you there were five because there were five and then a couple of days prior I was talking to talking to the label Laced and they're like, oh, it's a bit short for a vinyl oh, well, we'll fill up the vinyl with something else. I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'll write another song. But like, you were already coming out in a couple of days time. I was like, I don't want to put Mike off by saying, oh, and by the way, there's another song. So I waited until it was too late and said, by the way, there's another song. So you, know, <laughs> you, you, you were literally turning up to the studio with stuff that you'd like barely even heard. Well, that's become my norm now. When we did it, that was still unusual for me. I still felt like I wasn't being... It felt like I was being the lazy one, like to be hired to do a thing, to come in and be a drummer for such a project. For so long, I've always thought I need to spend hours. I need to spend so much energy and effort showing that I've learned the stuff. But learning and memorizing for me is a painful, semi, like, I don't want to say full-blown traumatic experience, but I've got an interesting history with classical music as a uh, being a classical musician as a child and having to learn music for you know recitals all the time that became competitions and i i was kind of like a sort of a prodigal young performer but i had three hours piano practice a day from a very strict a piano teacher and no one understood at least of all myself that like i was struggling with inattentive adhd so having to stay seated and learn stuff for three hours when you want to get up every 10 minutes i'd blocked a lot of memories out but it, it turns out i'd actually <laughs> had actually been semi-traumatized by the need to stay seated and forced to. And now I start to remember this deep pain and this deep actual internal trauma of like that then gets linked with learning any song. So the charts now I embrace it. I don't I tell people like don't worry about it, but I won't be charting this until the week before. And that doesn't mean it's going to be bad. It means I'm just going to be really focused when it happens because it takes the, the stress and the pressure out of memorizing it to do it. But then the process of recording it, comping it, or just recording it and someone else does the comp and the edit, and then I get to listen back to it a hundred times, the, the final part of it, then I can go and perform it as much as I want. But it, do, it feels like unfair to have to get to that point before you've done the recording. Very similar to how I treated the Tesseract session. I had to record everything as safeties in this room before we even went into the shoot in case mm -hmm. the shoot's uh, audio went wrong. So it could have yeah. been fake audio. And it, yeah, uh, thankfully, the recording process solidified like, yep, this is the best way to go. But you may have been like, oh, I'll wait until it's too late. But I would have been like, I can't be honest with you with the fact that I can't do it earlier. I just have to show up and sort of do it. I usually am charted before I show up, though. but things have been particularly tricky for me around that time. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the caveat with that approach of being a, a bit more 
relaxed with your preparation is of course you have to be at a certain level of musicality you have to feel a certain confidence in your ability in being able to interpret and play stuff quickly you can't do that if you're worried about getting your chops right and so uh, there is a caveat with that i want to swing back to something that you mentioned a few minutes ago because you said something that i agree with entirely and you said song first and i was thinking when you said that song first yeah ego second because that that has to be whether you're sessioning as a musician or whether you're producing i do a lot of producing and mixing and mastering for other artists like our egos as people that work for other people is always secondary to the outcome of the song and to the desires of the paying client like what what i think is best for the song doesn't matter if the client disagrees with me like yeah of course as a professional i'll offer my opinion and i'll say i think this do you agree if they say no i disagree i want this i have to go okay you know because ultimately what i think doesn't make any difference if it doesn't make the client happy and you know exactly the same for you as you know as a session player if you're doing a session it doesn't matter if you think something is the best thing you've ever played if the client goes no that's too busy for that part strip it back you have to go okay yeah fully you have to have no pride in that i mean it's it's really interesting ego is such a weird word with it because um, I feel like what we call ego is mostly just personal pride or like, you know, trust or like rejection, fear of rejection and things like that, because the core ego is like just the fact that there is an individual at work doing, making some kind of unique decisions. But like, it's the pride of like, no, you will do it my way because I think my way is better than yours is so damaging and detrimental. And I've been in so many sessions environments where the bands had a bad experience with that before. So they say, no, now we're going to go about this in this way. And they get really crazy about every detail. And it, they're actually pushing the problem harder than the uh, than the drummer possibly could. And it's made it a miserable experience for me, but I'll still go about it in their way. I had this experience today. I, I teach some musicians, um, some guitarists, some bands, some some drummers, how to listen to and modulate and process and plan for genty modern metal parts because it's very much a planning game a very it's very much a programming and analysis and mathematical puzzle solving in music form thing it goes so much deeper than the mechanics of playing drums so i teach a lot of guitarists about how to make better programming drums i, I absolutely love to do that it's like but i had this moment with an actual drummer here just a few hours ago one of my students and he said i said maybe try this part for this song because he, he's we're essentially we're writing new parts for the music he's made 25 years ago so there's all of this uh there's all of this muscle memory and the parts are very set in stone and now it's kind of like doing a 25th anniversary i'm like well what is important to you here is it that the is it that the music is gets its story across to the listener or is this just for you guys to listen back to and be like this is our growth within these songs and there's so many interesting moments but i suggested a different part to him and i realized in the moment i suggested it i'd broken the cardinal rule of teaching i said what do you think of this without him having any idea what the outcome could sound feel or be like so i changed my process entirely to be like try it for me so that I'm sure that it's not right kind of thing. Try it because it's interesting to try it. They, he tried it and then I got him to listen to it because the good thing about here is everything's always mic'd up, ready to record. So, And then he's listening back to it and going, whoa, I didn't realize it was like that. And it just shows that it takes a very long time and a lot of planning and skill and effort to hear music objectively while you're performing. Um, in fact, I think it's impossible. You can get close, but you can never get there. So you have to be okay with with listening back. And I want to loop back mostly around to something that you said around the, uh, you know, trying to stay up with your chops. Because when you're in a performance environment and it matters what you do in the moment, you can't be on the verge of your comfort zone. You, you literally can't do that to yourself or to anyone else because then you're the player who's going, sorry, can I just run that again? Sorry, that wasn't good enough. Sorry, that, that's not a creative vibe. You have to back out of that zone as much as is necessary to put the song first uh, and if you don't do that you're you're kind of like trying to be the hero for no good reason you're just putting the song second in your own personal journey with managing difficulty growth and maybe your own inferiority complexes getting thrown on top of that speaking from experience <laughs> so like i found a massive part of my journey over the last you know my whole career has been more like the the psychology of suggesting 
musical ideas, the psychology of showing rather than listening, but also, and I know I'm going on a million tangents, but it's something that Benny Greb said. I don't know if you know the drummer Benny Greb. Mm-hmm. Um, he said this at a, uh, at a at a talk, at a performance at one of the UK drum shows. And he says, don't treat others like you want to be treated. Treat them like they want to be treated. Because that's what will resonate with them. You know, if you say to, you know, your wife or your girlfriend after, you know, it's your 15th anniversary coming up or whatever. It's like, yeah, we're going to play COD all day. She's probably going to be like, or they will probably be like, that's not my idea of a nice a nice anniversary dinner. That's not why was what I was there for. So it was like, what what do they want? How do they respond to different learning and listening stimuli? Are there moments I can analyze where they're hearing something that I don't hear, or I'm hearing something that they don't hear? And then you're into the territory of how much are you listening to the demo memory in your head of maybe the times you didn't play it well enough versus what's actually on the recording. So the most important thing for me always has been change it and change it quick. Rip that band-aid off new program drums a, a round of breaking demo writers before i even pick up a stick because at least then we're into a similar territory i've brought them closer to where i'm at in that it's now new and it's not like how can i fit your old memory and more like where can this where can this grow into mm-hmm. if you know what i mean without so many moving parts to to that answer though <laughs> yeah but it's it's a really interesting conversation about effectively about psychology right talking of psychology a bit I'm going to segue into I'm talking about mental health a bit and musicians' health and your health as a musician. People that know your story a bit will know that you had quite a serious playing injury for a while that meant that you basically couldn't play drums for a, for a number of years. Let me ask you about that. Firstly for, for people, firstly, for anybody that doesn't know, tell them about that injury that you had. And then I want to know what you did did in order to try and cope with that mentally and physically in the period where you couldn't play drums and you therefore you know, couldn't be on the road touring with monuments at the time well it's a really it's there's so many, many levels to the answer but i'll try to keep it concise it's, it's i have a big advocate for mental health and for well-being and getting away from self-harm and uh, self-hatred of any kind so that's where i'll like that's the preface to this answer um, but when I left Monuments because I, because I couldn't play properly, I didn't just leave because I couldn't play, but because playing had become miserable in that set because the music was so powerful and my obsession with sounding like as good as I could possibly sound, being perfectionist, was more important than my health. I wasn't even aware of my health. But essentially, I was self-harming on stage and being applauded for it. Um, yes, I am playing. Yes, it is still music. But in an in a way it was kind of like standing on a stage and punching myself in the face and people are like yes that was great uh, and there were there were really dark shows where i played myself into the inability to stand after the kit like i played the worse i felt the harder i played and that's not logical that's a mental health issue that's self harm that's self hatred that's uh, perfectionism that's that's all sorts of weird and rough things so when i left monuments i still pursued music i i still tried to drum i still put myself in session positions where i was in studios that people were paying for and trying to drum and not being able to and feeling guilty about that and just staying locked in this cycle and that continued all the way through 2015 until 2017 when i did a tour and i literally couldn't walk one day and so I had to play keyboard drums at the gig. It's something I'd learned while my hip didn't work because I had hip surgery. I'd torn the inside of my hip and I'd torn the shoulder. So I could do the keyboard thing, the, the, the piano stuff I'd done. And, you know, just so that I could remain obsessive in learning of learning about music, remain connected with, with that medium of emotional communication, that language. But even even not being able to walk and having to play on a keyboard drum kit, three months later, I went out on tour again with an artist called Angel Vivaldi, and I it got to Prague three weeks in, and three days off wasn't enough. I still couldn't walk. I'd really pushed it too far. I had to fly home from that tour, and that's where I was like, I can't run from this anymore. I have to take care of this. So within two years of that, I'd, uh, you know, all the work I'd done with my physio up until that point, because it had been really painful. We'd mostly focused on my shoulder. Now the work was really on like, I'm now going to stop and work out what's going on here. And then Mm -hmm. managed to, I had to fight to get it, but I got a scan uh, that said I was, that showed the injury that I had because the first scans I had 
didn't show it. The quality of the scanners wasn't good enough. All this time, mentally, I've like I'm kind of checked out. Like I'm just I'm just getting depressed. Like I've developed uh, stomach issues from being on painkillers by lying in bed all day, and I've now got like stomach hernia that will follow me for the rest of my life because of that. And um, so emotionally, getting to have the surgery and then coming back to playing then coming back to monuments and then covid hitting was just the craziest experience because it's like five years of stop start not happy with this but having to come starting to learn how to be healthy with things and then feeling ready for it and then the whole world shuts down and then that's kind of why gaming and stuff became so important to me because of uh, i was streaming because i was like i'm not stopping now i'm like i'm ready to go i don't care the world's in shutdown i'm i'm not gonna stop again and it's sad that I found myself more now relating. I find myself now relating to so many more people because now I'm not the only one in my social group or my professional group who's had to stop for a while. But I don't, I don't, I don't say that with any joy. Uh, but it is something where it meant that now everyone has had some kind of an experience, sort of like I had had then, which means that that's a bit more relatable. And I think it's why mental health is talked about so much more now because everyone's gone oh, no if we're shut down and we have to not socialize and stay away from everyone and try to live normally we're we're in a really rough spot now so yeah it's and given me an ability to to work past that and then to become healthy stay healthy sound powerful without hurting myself and learn how to pace myself essentially yeah and you know when when there are such high profile tragedies in the music industry like like chester bennington and chris cornell and those sorts of horrible things, you know, it, it does help to raise the profile of how difficult it can be for musicians to look after themselves, particularly when, you know, when they're on the road. Like it gets painted as a, you know, as a glamorous thing, but, you know, most, most touring musicians are stuck in the back of, you know, small pokey tour vans or, you know, in tiny bunks in a tour bus for, you know, hours and hours on end, you know, going straight from venue to venue away from loved ones you know it's not having enough time to do physical health perhaps not really looking after their diet because when you're on the road it's difficult to get you know good nutritious nutritious meals in and stuff so you know it's it's hard right you you have to you have to make a real conscientious effort every day to look after yourself mentally and, and physically. And I know from my personal experience, my my life over the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years, my mental and physical health has been has been a massive yo-yo, um, especially since uh, my little brother died 10, 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago. You know, obviously that had a big effect on me and problems with, with alcohol and all, so all sorts of things. It's You go through swathes of, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it. I need to look after myself. Okay, I'm going to sort some diet out. I'm going to drink less. I'm going to talk to a therapist. I'm going to try some different medication for my depression. I'm going to whatever. And then you go through a period and you're like, okay, I'm good now. I'm better. And then it's like you, you start regressing again and you it's only after years of, in my experience, years of yo-yoing physical and mental health that you realize that physical and mental health is not something that is ever better. It's something that is a, a continuum. You're mm -hmm. never going to get to a point where you're good. You're always going to be somewhere in the middle where you have to keep choosing every day yourself, choosing to look after yourself because ultimately nobody else can do that for you. Yeah, I mean... It's a tragedy that you've been through, and I'm, you know, it always saddens me so much to hear about it. But there's, there's so much that I struggle with with the fact that our minds can't process trauma without help, because we can't move past things sometimes without help. We can't make memories into memories because something about our minds brings it back into the present, and it's not fair. But it is just some kind of old, broken evolution. Is like you know layers on top of layers. You know our eyes are still our eyes are still designed to look underwater. The fact that at some point we got you know our lineage got out of the water, the eye is still nowhere near as good as it would be if it were underwater. It's never going to go backwards. It'll only go forwards. And this is the same. It's just stacks on top of stacks. And things like therapy are fantastic for finding the root cause of the injury, as opposed to putting band-aids on top of so things like gym drinking less you know they're kind of like like there's there's like a mixture of like you know if you're hurting you uh you, you know you kind of want to find a band-aid sometimes alcohol for some recreational drugs especially on tour it's a really 
high adrenaline environment with very little peace of mind. It's very, it's, it makes everything go completely out of whack. It's an addictive personality. It's an, and it's an addictive situation to be in. And when the night gets quiet, you don't want it to get quiet. 3 a.m. You're wanting to have your night out because you've just finished essentially work. But like, you know, you can become addicted to the crowds, the, the, the laudable kind of, you know, great set man, you know, hanging out at the merch stand. And then you don't want it to end because yeah, yeah. Ultimately, you may not be that comfortable within your own skin. Mm -hmm. And you'll always take as much crap from yourself as you were willing to take from the rest of the world as well. Mm -hmm. Like you, you'll, you'll beat yourself up as much as you're okay to be beaten up. And at some point, you don't even realize that you haven't developed any tolerance for like saying like, no, that's not okay with me. I know that that will hurt me. I know that this will be bad for me. And I, I've only started to learn that in the last few years so yeah. i can imagine it's kind of similar for you but thankfully we do have music to to communicate emotionally but it's very mm -hmm. much very much a continuum as you say yeah so segueing from from that last comment you've fairly recently left mon monuments permanently um you you decided that was the right thing for you at this moment in in your life and career so what what is filling your time now what's what what are you focusing on what are you hoping to move more into um have you got any specific projects or collaborations that you're working on right now that you can tell us about um talk to us about mike post monuments well it's uh it's a, it's a great question the interesting thing is is that like i also left monuments permanently the last time so you could never it's it's kind of a permanence is a very strange word because in the moment of going i'd be like yeah never again and now i know having come back from that and grown over five years being like ah things can change. So, you know, never say never to anything. But yes, the right move for me in terms of now I've learned what I need. And all the all these changes I made over the COVID period were while I was still back in the band. And how it felt before COVID and after COVID was completely different. Been through some losses, you know, during the process, really discovered that like family is something that is so important to me. It always has been. And I kind of got sick of feeling that sad to be missing everyone all the time. And Putting that first it ended up making me resent touring, and that's not fair on anyone. If you're out there resenting what you're doing, and they're there to see you play, and your band, it's not fair on your bandmates, it's not fair on you, it's not fair on your family, it's not fair on the fans. It's literally a lose, 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 lose for everyone. Apart from the fact that it's harder to accept that it's better that we're not doing it at all. But moving on from that, because the decision was kind of like to cut a part of myself off to grow the rest of me, uh, there's been a period of just fucking around and finding out <laughs> like i realize the joy is in doing is and that's the goal i can have as many goals and growth exercises as i want and places i want to get to but the only thing i've been interested in now having learned how much goal chasing can make me miserable is how can i enjoy the how can i love the doing of every project as much as possible what is it i actually love doing not where i want to be and that's been beautiful because it's allowed me to try different things out. I started off the year doing a Simon and Garfunkel theater tour, filling in and, uh, you know, helping a production out very last minute. Again, like a one day notice kind of thing, like drummer, drummer isn't working out for this. We need someone very fast. You fly to Portugal tomorrow. You say yes. And I'm like, perfect. I don't have a plan. So I went to go out there and learn some more about myself. And then things like, you know, I can't remember exactly when the recording session was for Colt. Uh, when did we track this? It's such a blur for me. It was last year. It was before Christmas. I want to say like October time. That sounds about right. Yeah, because Maybe. the weather was still nice, but starting to get like a little chilly towards the end. So it's like shoulder season. Yeah. 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 So, okay. yeah. So more or less a, a year ago from, from now. Yeah. Perfect. So in that moment, I've a, I'm a guy who's like, I think I'm going to leave. I'm going to give it a couple of weeks and see how I feel. And then I go back into the thing of like, the magic of trying to do stuff with lots of other different people, exploring other sides of music, more joyful, more meaningful, more spiritual, more like uh, soft, calm, you know, re-engaging with piano, different experiences. I'd be happier jumping between experiences than I ever would be doing the same thing over and over again, especially when that thing is such a heavy and angry sounding thing. It's, it, it, I think it takes a toll on me. Um, as much as I'm drawn to it, it kind of burns me. It's like an Icarus situation. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I think in that moment I was like, yeah, now I'm now that this kind of stuff is happening as well, and it's happening more and more. You know that I'm getting the opportunity to play with different really cool music and gaming experiences. What if I could do this stuff more? What 
what if I really took a chance on myself? And th that's led to this year being a multitude of different things, sessions, but also trying out being a publicist in, a, in the weirdest of ways, like interviewing other musicians or developing relationships with companies, uh, scan audio, scan pro audio video and pro gaming, um, you know, developing a relationship with them where I would help them to create marketing materials, which aren't really marketing materials. They're just, they want to have some cool interviews with cool bands, but they didn't know how to get the interviews. They didn't know what that whole world looked like. So I'd just be like, I'll help you out. I'll just be a publicist for, for a festival. And it was the most excited I'd ever been for a festival in forever, just getting to go and, and purely just have conversations. I love meeting these p wonderful people. I got to meet the guys from Sungazer, had a wonderful sit down chat with Dan Tompkins from Tesseract and Jay Postones, Mr. Greggles, another streamer. All these bands that I never would have known. And I just, I think I did like 16. I even got to chat with Dirty Loops. But then I realized I've been nice. so busy with the sessions after that. I haven't had time to work on the video at all. All the I even filmed my own video about what it's like to just have conversations with musicians at a festival. And I've always had a love of media and video as much as gaming. And I realized maybe this is the future for me. Like, mm -hmm. I still want to make music. I still want the musician in me to be the excited, inspired person. But I want to I wanna put that into the realm of capturing that in video capturing that in conversations, in, in hangouts, hosting my own shows, creating other shows whereby these magical moments that I feel so lucky and so appreciative to have had experienced to just grow on those and open up more of the world to see that. I feel like my favorite times in life have been the jam room in 030 at Brit School, like the jam that I had with the beginning of learning and meeting my fellow cohort of students at Brit School. We didn't go to the, uh, to the open talk, like the, the, we didn't go to the headmaster's speech. We all just essentially just walked into an unlocked music room and just started playing. And no one told us off for it. We, they just, they actually gave us instruments, you know, like uh, Chris, AKA Tintin and uh, Declan. And, uh, <laughs> he doesn't Chris, like that. Oh. Chris, Chris Elston, like yes. one of uh, the most champion. knowledgeable technicians yeah you you could ever wish to meet yeah. I, yeah I did him dirty I drew I drew him as Tintin at the end of the at the end of year Christmas thing and he he, he wasn't particularly stoked on that but it was funny um, well I could imagine yeah <laughs> poor Chris he, he, he did he did have a, a striking resemblance but yeah the, it was the fact that they were like we were like oh this cable's broken oh this guitar isn't quite and Declan would just be like yeah I'll sort that here have this one and we were like this is insane. We're literally being naughty by getting together and jamming, but like everyone's just happy to see that we're happy and like this is now being it's, prioritized. And it's what you were there for. You were there to make music. So you're not being naughty if you're there to make music. Yeah. Well, we're not doing our responsibilities. We're, we're literally bunking off of the first thing we've been told to sit down for induction. You know, we're like, yeah. <laughs> but I'll never forget that. And, and I've, I've chased that feeling my whole life and i don't get that jamming expression from recitals especially metal recitals all the time unless there's a level of improvisation because or the the material's changing constantly because it just it just gets old there's only so much exploration i can have within it it's like you read the same book every day for three years <laughs> you're gonna be so sick of that book it could have been your favorite book one day it could still be that your favorite style of book but you know other fans of that book might not understand why you hate it so much, you know, yeah, and yeah. it's, it's, it's such an interesting thing, but that's why I'm trying to just keep it, keep it changing. I think now I'm getting to the end of this year, I'm going to spend the next few months trying out full-time media creation, streaming, YouTube, seeing what happens if I commit to that, because I figured I've got nothing to lose. And if I can't take a chance on myself, who, who can I, I know I want, I know this makes me happy. It's nice to put my hobbies and my passions first rather than what I'm expected and what I've done in the past first. But I still want to do it because it makes me happy. But just yeah. as an as a thing that enables me to, you know, do the rest of it, you know, like the necessary part of the process. But, you know, then I can still enjoy it because it, it, it is very stressful having to leverage your musical love for a career, for, for a paycheck. It, for me, I've always struggled with being a service provider, having to feel like I have to find another person to make another album for. Is a horrible feeling, uh, you know. And I was trying to explore getting out of that for the longest of times. And that's when initially, when you when you hit me up about this at the time, there was no there was no talk of financial recompense or anything. It was just like, do you want to do it? No idea if this is going to be a thing from that part, but do you want to? And I was like, yeah, of course, you know. And I want to be in a position where I can say yes to stuff like that more. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I can't, you, you, I can't run away from that feeling. It's too, yeah. too damn powerful. Well, one thing is for sure that opportunities present themselves to people that seek opportunities. For those that sit back waiting for opportunities to come knocking, they rarely do. Um, and look, Mike, I could continue this conversation for hours and hours. There are so many little things that I could pick up on, but we, uh, I'm sure we've given people enough food for thought in the last hour or so. Um, so I'm going to say thank you so, so much for your time. It's been great to chat to you. You are so welcome. I'd love to do this again sometime. So any listeners of Sam's wonderful uh, world of podcasting and media, wherever you're seeing this, if you want to see more, please let him know. Let me know. Keep following this wonderful man and all of his endeavors because he's, he's an absolute G. And uh, I hope to spend many more times chatting, working with, playing with and teaching and learning from teaching with and learning from the more the merrier basically so you know let us know if you want to see that and thank you sam for everything you are a gentleman it's been a pleasure thanks mike you're super welcome man take care